Hello everyone, welcome to Let's Learn Physics, the show where I do my best to explain graduate level physics in ways accessible to anyone with an interest in advanced physics. Today we'll be going into Chapter 2 of Classical Mechanics by Herbert Goldstein. Last time we learned about the idea of generalized coordinates and the Lagrangian, which we can use to find equations of motion. These equations of motion can then be solved to find most of the equations in physics textbooks. From Newton's second law to PV equals nRT to Maxwell's equations of electromagnetism to so many more. This time we're going to learn about a powerful new concept called action. So let's get to it. Section 2.1 begins by asking us to imagine a system changing from one state to another over time. The easiest way to conceptualize this as a particle moving through space. But it also applies to a box of gas changing volume and pressure, electromagnetic fields propagating, and anything that can be represented as generalized coordinates. Any such system can be represented as a point moving through some kind of space with a dimension for every coordinate. This is called configuration space. So one particle moving through the three-dimensional universe would be a point moving with three coordinates through 3D space. Two particles could be represented by a single point moving through six-dimensional space, three dimensions for each particle, and so on and so on. For a system with some number of generalized coordinates, configuration space models the system as a dot moving through that many dimensions. For systems that change over time, we can take two snapshots. The first snapshot is at time one, or T1. The second snapshot is at time two, or T2. And each time has a different state. So over time, the system evolved from state one at T1 through configuration space to state two at T2. This is a lot of fancy words, but what it means is that something is changing over time, and there's a snapshot at the beginning and a snapshot at the end. So the question is, how did it get from the first snapshot to the second snapshot? There are many possible paths it could have taken. So if you imagine a particle starting here and ending here, it could have gone straight there, it could have gone up and around, maybe it's falling in free fall. It could have gone down, maybe it's swinging. It could have bounced back and forth a few times and then ended up there. As long as it started here at time one and ended here at time two, we can consider all possible paths it could have taken in the meantime. And every possible path picks up something along the way called the action. The action is equal to the amount of Lagrangian picked up over every infinitesimal motion along that path. So you chop down the path into an infinite number of pieces and you add up every little piece of Lagrangian along that path. That gives you an integral that looks like this. And as a reminder, the Lagrangian is equal to the kinetic energy minus potential energy. So how does this help us? How is this useful? Well, it turns out that the path that has the least action, that is the lowest difference between kinetic energy and potential energy added up along the entire path, is the true path that the state actually took. It is the true path through n-dimensional configuration space that the coordinates went through from T1 to T2. It is the way the system changed starting at snapshot one and ending at snapshot two. This is one of the most significant concepts in all of physics, the principle of least action. 2.2 is a math heavy section deriving Lagrange's equations, remember these equations that we use to find the equations of motion, from the principle of least action. We do this by varying the coordinates, just not at the endpoints, which mathematically is represented like this. We then plug the varied coordinates into the action integral and compare it with the non-varied action integral. If you know calculus, you know that variation means take a derivative. So to find the variation of the action, we take the derivative of the action with respect to the variation parameter, and we get this. Now that looks intimidating, but we know if the action is going to be at a minimum, this whole thing better be zero. This part is the variation of the coordinate, so we know that that's not zero, which means that this part has to be equal to zero. And that is the Lagrange equations that we know and love from chapter one. Phew, what did we learn here? 
Well, we learned that there is math justification for these equations that we've been using in the past. We learned that Lagrange's equations are in fact the correct equations of motion that describe how a state changes over time because we compared that to all the different ways it could have changed over time and found that those different ways are incorrect. The chapter then takes a detour away from physics into the land of pure math with three examples of how to use this math to solve geometry problems. The first example takes two points and uses calculus of variations to find the shortest distance between them, which, surprise surprise, is a straight line. The second example says, what if we take two points in 3D space and we draw some line between them such that if we revolve that line around the axis, the surface area is minimized. The curve that ends up being the correct solution is called a catenary. And the third example is assuming gravity on the Earth's surface, what shape does something have to slide down between two points in order for the time to be minimized? And the solutions to this problem are brachistochrones. Section 2.3 is another math heavy section that specifically proves that if the variation in the action is zero, it means Lagrange's equations are correct for every generalized coordinate in the system. Section 2.4 asks the question, what if there are constraints in the system so that the generalized coordinates are not independent? For instance, what if we have a dot that is on top of a sphere and can slide down? In this case, the dot can't move in the x, y, or z direction without also moving in another direction. Thus, the coordinates are dependent. To deal with this, we change the action integral to look like this, and Lagrange's equations are modified to look like this. That extra term with the lambdas are the forces of the constraint. In the case of our sphere example, it is the normal force of the sphere keeping the dot from falling through the sphere. That force changes depending on where the dot is and how fast it's moving in order to keep the dot on the sphere. And if we set that force equal to zero, we find the angle on the sphere where the dot falls off, where the force is no longer pushing it away from the sphere because it doesn't need to, because its inertia is pulling it away. And as a note, this process only works for holonomic and semi-holonomic constraints. That is, constraints where the constraint forces always push perpendicular to the motion. Again, looking at the sphere, the normal force always points directly away from the sphere, but the dot does not move in that direction. And as another side note, what counts as a holonomic constraint or a semi-holonomic constraint? A holonomic constraint only depends on the coordinates of the system and time. A semi-holonomic constraint can also depend on the changes in coordinates. Neither of these are allowed to depend on the second time derivative of the coordinates or to have a greater than or less than sign in them. As an example, it goes into the idea of a hoop rolling down a slope without slipping. The without slipping part is a constraint that can be written mathematically like this. What it means is that the distance around the circumference of the hoop that has touched the ground is equal to the distance the hoop has traveled down the slope. And you might notice from this equation that it makes the coordinates redundant. And you could rework this problem to have only one coordinate instead of two. But we use the process of constraint forces in this section to show that sometimes we don't have to. So we go through the process we usually do. We write down an expression for the kinetic energy, an expression for the potential energy, and then plug them into Lagrange's equations. And after doing all the math, we find that the constraint parameter is equal to this. And what we found here is the force of friction that prevents the hoop from slipping. Section 2.5 begins by talking about some advantages of using the variational method. The principle of least action and Lagrange's equations to find the equations of motion. It is elegant. It is a single principle that is widely applicable. Remember, this is the process used in tandem with experiments to find most of the famous equations of physics. It is coordinate invariant. The kinetic energy and the potential energy are the same regardless of what choice of coordinates we use. There's an abstract advantage, which it's clear why the Lagrangian can have a gauge derivative. Because if you look for the variation in the integral of a derivative, but you don't change the endpoints, that whole thing is zero. Also, this method can be extended to fields, 
which are extremely important in most of physics. Finally, many physical systems have exactly the same math. So if you solve for the math in one system, you can use the same ideas in the other system. For some examples, if we look at an RL circuit, that is a circuit with a resistor and an inductor, we get an equation for the current that looks like this, which is the same math as the velocity of a solid sphere falling through a viscous fluid. In an LC circuit, the charge on a capacitor is given by this equation, which is exactly the same equation we get for the position of a simple harmonic oscillator. Section 2.6 talks about conservation and symmetry. The principle of least action gives us an equation of motion for every coordinate. These equations contain two derivatives, which means we have to integrate them twice, and so we end up with two constants for every coordinate. The constants depend on initial conditions. Here's an example you might have seen before, a kinematic equation. The position of an object undergoing constant acceleration is equal to the initial position, a constant, plus the initial velocity, another constant, times time, plus an acceleration term. So we have constants. Let's pivot a little bit and look at particles moving in 3D space in a conservative field. If we take this derivative, we get mass times velocity which we know as momentum. Remember, a dot over a variable means it's change over time. So if x represents position, x dot represents velocity. Knowing this is true for points moving in space, we can talk about a generalized momentum. We do that same derivative except to the generalized velocity. And remember, a general coordinate doesn't have to be a position in space. It could be basically anything, like the pressure or volume of a box of gas. This generalized momentum is sometimes called the canonical momentum or the conjugate momentum. For example, the conjugate momentum of charged particles moving in an electric field is equal to the ordinary momentum plus a term involving the magnetic potential. If a Lagrangian does not depend on a certain coordinate, that coordinate is cyclic. For instance, if you have something sliding with no friction on a completely horizontal plane, that x-coordinate, that horizontal coordinate, is cyclic. Nothing changes whether it's here or here. The system is the same. That's called a symmetry. This dot moving or sliding along the surface is in translational symmetry. It doesn't matter if it's here or if it's here. The physics is the same. If we look at the equation of motion, it means this term disappears, and all that we're left with is this. But that's the rate of change of the momentum. So what we've discovered is that if a coordinate is cyclic, its conjugate momentum is conserved. For that dot sliding across the ground, there is no force changing its speed, so its momentum is going to be conserved. In this case, we can eliminate the velocity for that coordinate from the equation and use the momentum as a constant instead. This section then provides examples deriving the conservation of linear momentum and conservation of angular momentum. Cyclic coordinates are related to symmetries, which foreshadows one of the most famous theorems in physics, Noether's theorem, which we'll talk about in a later chapter. The final section, 2.7, introduces the energy function and the idea of conservation of energy. It begins by playing with math. If we take the full time derivative of the Lagrangian and put that together with the Lagrange equations, we get this. That first part, that ugly, annoying derivative, we can call the energy function. And we get this much nicer looking equation. This, by the way, is foreshadowing another future concept, the Hamiltonian. If the Lagrangian does not depend explicitly on time, then the change in the energy function equals zero, and the energy function is conserved. And here I'm going to interject with my own example, which is a particle in one dimensional space with a conservative field. The kinetic energy is one half times the mass times the velocity squared, as we know from college physics. The potential energy only depends on the position. And of course, the Lagrangian is equal to kinetic energy minus potential energy. If we do the derivative for the energy function, we end up with two times the kinetic energy. So the energy function is equal to 2 times the kinetic energy minus the Lagrangian, or 2 times the kinetic energy minus the kinetic energy plus the potential energy, or the kinetic energy plus the potential energy, or the total energy, which means in this case the energy function 
is equal to the total energy, and the total energy is conserved. The way the book derives this is more general with more specific math conditions. Like, the energy function is not always conserved, nor does it always equate to the total energy of the system. And one key difference here between the energy function and the Lagrangian is that the energy function depends on the specific choice of coordinates, whereas the Lagrangian does not. And the last note the chapter brings up is that when there are dissipative forces, the dissipation function is related to the decay rate of the energy function. And in the special cases where the energy function is equal to the total energy, the total energy decreases at a rate of twice the dissipation. So in this chapter we learned about the principle of least action and how it can be used to derive Lagrange's equations of motion. Next time we'll look at how it applies to the central force problem. That is a conservative force field that all points toward a single point, the source. If you want to be notified when that video comes out, you can subscribe and hit the bell. Let me know what you think in the comments or if you have any questions. Don't forget to like, and if you think education like this is valuable, you can find ways to support me in the description. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.